Hello, welcome everybody to this Insta Live. I hope you're well. I hope you've had a great day. Thank you so much for tuning in. We're excited to have Dr. Tuma Amuthan on board today talking about being a GP who has a specialist interest in dermatology. I'm just waiting for Thuma to come on board. Let's see if I can add him in. Hi, you okay, man? Yeah, good to see you. How's your day? You do, good to see you. Um, it's been okay. I have a long call for GMF, so interesting day. Okay, yeah. I, I was just saying to these guys, there must be some crazy days, some crazy work stories going on at the moment. And um, I guess you're trying to balance your GP side of things up with your dermatology. Absolutely, which, yeah. Which sounds like it's going really well. I, I think so, I think so. Having just, you know, recently qualified, I think I'm trying to do the, as best as I can to learn as much as I can in the short yeah. space of time, given yeah, yeah, the yeah. pandemic. But, yeah. yeah, well, you're doing some really good things and we'll try and get into some of the things that you're doing and some of the, because it sounds like you're doing a lot of different things in dermatology as well. And I certainly, we, we do a lot of GP trainees, obviously, and we get a lot of questions about how to get into dermatology as a GP and what is the gypsy life of a dermatology all about. It seems like one of the more popular specialist interests that people tend to think about when it comes to general practice. So it'd be good to hear your story, some ideas and tips about how to get in. Um, what it's really like, is it as it's perceived by lots of other doctors and GPs themselves, um, and just get an idea of what your work works like and how you how you split between the GP side of things and the derm side of things, and maybe a bit about how one helps the other and vice versa, how being a GP helps the derm stuff and how your increased derm knowledge helps the GP stuff. So really quick background to you, I know when was the last time we met? It seems like a long time ago, but it wasn't that long. It was a long time. Yeah, it was a long time ago, wasn't it? Yeah. Was it long? Was it? It, 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 didn't seem, it, it seems a long time, but I think it was probably about a year ago, I guess. I'd say so, yes, yeah. Something to do with exams, probably. Yeah, definitely, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, those, those, those stressful days that are behind you now. And, 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 and to talk about your GP training years, obviously you had to deal with all these exams and go through all of this stuff, but was dermatology on your mind from the beginning? Like, when did the whole derm thing kick off in your mind? I think uh, initially the first thing I did um, or the first time I thought about dermatology was uh, when I started doing aesthetics. For the, you know, I've always been an entrepreneurial thing, so I was looking at that, um, started the course, set up my own clinic, and I thought, you know, dermatology would go really well. And, you know, the other thing was initially when I set out following medical school, I wanted to do orthopedics and become a surgeon. So I thought, you know what, um, that's not for me. I want the flexibility and I want the variety you get in general practice and, uh, you know, the rapport that you build up with patients. So that's why I chose general practice. And then, you know, you never just give up looking for that practical hands-on thing, do you? So I, that was, I was looking for that. That's how I find aesthetics. And I was like, you know what, them will go really well. And, of course, the minor surgery elements of it, that goes really well. And I think it's the attention to detail you get with dermatology is that, yes, it's a small field, but, you know, we are dealing with the biggest organ in your body. And um, there are only so much, that, but then you have to pay such close attention to differentiate the manager plans and things that you yeah. give the patient. So I guess that's what drew me to dermatology. Okay. So initially it was surgery and, and TNO specifically. Mm. Um, and then some of those, those, I suppose, reasons that drew you towards TNO, you've looked at how can you incorporate that into a world as, uh, of general practice, which is quite, quite smart. So you managed to kind of balance <laughs> both, yeah. both up together. Um, exactly, and, yeah. and, and was the plan always to go into the gypsy route or was it always that um, the way I'm going to integrate dermatology into my general practice is to become a, a gypsy or was it initially thinking that aesthetics is going to be my side thing um, and the derm bit came a little bit later like how was that how was that journey and when did that all come about? I think uh, it, it was as most things do as I'm sure you know with your experience uh, things just fall into place the opportunities come uh, as you explore one thing after the next so obviously, I did uh, the aesthetic course about three years ago, and I you know, just set up by myself, doing family and friends, started off building a small portfolio of that work. And you do have to build every element of it when you're doing aesthetic in private practice, again, as I'm sure you know. Um, so I guess I've got that experience from doing that. And then I was, again, looking for that extra hands-on thing when I was training. And I was, a year before training, I'd already started planning for what I'm going to do after training, what I wanted to do. So I was looking out for the opportunities. And then it's just by chance that I happened to come across the dermatology fellowship that Modality were offering, which is a full in-house um, sort of run-through program, if you want to call it that, um, in that <clears throat> they fund your diploma, 
they give you hands-on experience and you get to you know four sessions a week with uh, a gypsy or a consultant supervising you um, and they train you up so and, you know it was just too good to turn down so yeah. then that's how it just happened again that was only because I was preemptively looking for opportunities and planning out what I was going to do for post CCD a year in advance yeah. and then of course now it, we're full there's, we're not taking any more there's the odd person that comes through I think there's just been a recent call out actually so actually I'll, I'll take that back there we are accepting more um trainees but uh it's a as you say something that's in demand so you need to prove your motivation and your uh, why they should have you so i already had that in that i'd already explored the aesthetics of the career and that means i could do minor surgery on the face comfortably yeah. and it wouldn't be shaking um and, you know that that was a big sell for them i guess yeah, um, yeah, yeah. and um I had proactively looked for something, so they know that I'm definitely interested. It's not just a fleeting thought. So it's just selling your motivation, and I guess I sold that to them, and they were happy to have me. So it was just job time. And then there's two important points in there, that, that you, you really did start planning this in advance, didn't you? It wasn't that, oh, I'm kind of halfway through GB training, that that looks like a good no. idea, and, and, and let's see what's around. You'd put the, the, the groundwork in before, and I think that's super important, given that it's such a – um, I talked about route for GP. Lots of people sort of talk about gypsy and dermatology, but very few actually get to that point because I guess, A, the competition level is so high, but B, the majority of the people who are talking about it probably haven't put the groundwork in at the beginning or planned it early enough. So that's a, that's a really good point. Um, and, and we'll come back to that a little bit later, the, the, the planning and the things that you did to try and get yourself in the position to get that opportunity that you did. But just so people get an idea about the, the kind of stuff that you're doing. Um, so just let me know, when did you finish GP, when did you finish GP training? When did you come out completely? Just August gone. So August gone, okay. Four or five months. Okay, so four or five months. And what, what is yeah. your kind of breakdown right now? Just so people know, what are the roles yeah. that you're doing, GP side, derm side, private stuff, all that kind of stuff together? Yeah. So my week looks like this. So I'm a trailblazer fellow. So I get Mondays off to do CPD. So two sessions of CPD a week to do my dermatology diploma and the trailblazer side of things. Tuesday morning, I am doing laser minor surgery uh, in um, uh, the Medality Medical Spa, uh, the hands-on for the NHS side of things. Tuesday afternoon is our Medality Spa private clinic where we do anything from uh, Botox fillers, laser, CO2 laser, uh, you know, skin refer surfacing, um, minor surgery, you name it, we do it, to just general practice, private work as well. Uh, Wednesday all day is mostly dermatology, so two full sessions of dermatology, apart from the odd morning where I'm teaching the fellows in black country. Um, Thursday and Friday is full on GP, um, and then uh, on the weekends, pre-COVID, I was teaching uh, Botox and Fitness for Dermo Medical um, as a national trainer for them. Um, and then uh, exactly, my clinic exactly, on top. Exactly. Mm. That's yeah, Zach that's exactly, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Zach and Tan. I remember yeah. Zach. And then, uh, <laughs> I remember Zach in his, in his uh, GP training years. I remember Zach a few years uh -huh, ago. Uh -huh. Okay. So you well, did he, Was he up here? Yeah. Uh, no, he wasn't, he wasn't here, but I remember him talking, using our YouTube stuff when he was doing his, his uh, okay. exams. So, uh, correct, yes, correct. I remember Zach from, from a while ago. So I didn't realize you worked with Zach and you had some of your training yeah. through, through them. Ah, interesting. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So your week is pretty full on then. And, and is that a five-day fellowship then that you are that is a year a year long is that how is that how it works the one that you've got it's a 10 session uh salaried contract um, okay. um so there is this fellowship doesn't have a finite limit to it it's a, an ongoing contract okay. uh but how long they can sustain the cpd thing uh, i'm not sure but i haven't heard anything to the contrary uh but that's we'll come to that in a year's time yeah yeah i, I suppose it, it, it depends on how much value you've given us in it and and, and if, you, exactly. if they're likely that they'll, they'll find a way to keep you like like most people Perfect. do in most organizations but um so just get, to give an idea about competition then roughly how many people went for that fellowship do you know and how many people got in just to give people an idea about how competitive it is to get into this derm world as a gp i think uh, at the time i was applying um i don't think it was well advertised and it wasn't out there. Um, I'd heard of them because I went to one of the BMA RCGP uh, job conferences as such, and they were out there in force and applying for it. Um, and they have uh, 12 or 13 different uh, specialties. So there's loads of applications. It was a whole day of interviews. Uh, my, me and my colleague went, went along uh, and we both got the job. So I, I don't know exactly how many people applied for it, 
but, but I would I would have thought uh, I I I think it's more of a case of uh, the outlook of the organisation that modality is is that they want to look for people and invest in people if okay. they think they're worth investing in. So I think if there's someone who has a credible case, uh, I don't think uh, it'll be a yes or no case. I think it would be a sort of sitting down and con making that, having that conversation to decide what they can offer each other. Okay, so basically you, you, you went to various things. I know you have lots, you used to do a lot with the college and, and, and BMA, and it's through those opportunities that you kind of picked this up and then you followed it through and look, and, and look where you are now, which is great, mm. which is a great story. And, and mm. often the story of many people who do many great things, it's not about, it just kind of happened by chance. It's about the doing, you know, doing, putting the effort in and, and making use of the opportunities that come. So that's good. People know a little bit about what you do then. So why do you think dermatology as a GP is so popular? Why do you think so many people think of, you know, because there's lots of different specialties you can go into as a GP, whereas dermatology, minor surgery, those two, I often hear you know, very highly of. So why do you think that is? Why do you think so many people think of it? I think uh, there's a couple of reasons for it. I think it's about 20 to 30 percent of all primary care contacts are skin related. Um, I think that's one of the predominant reasons. Uh, and I think the second one is the fact you get some toys to play with, I guess. You get a dermatoscope, you get a yeah. scalpel, uh, and you get to do something hands-on. Because as a GP, especially now, you just sat behind a screen, aren't you, doing yeah. calls back-to-back. -back. And even, even in general consultations, with general medis medical consultations, uh, how many times do you actually examine a patient pre-COVID? Yeah, because, you know, one of the projects I did was 85% uh, of complaints or contacts in primary care can be dealt with over the phone with no physical contact requirement in hands-on or anything. So that's what we're used to. So I guess everyone's out for that variety. Mm. And of the variety, I think dermatology and minor surgery are the ones that are most easily accessible. If you look at the other ones, like urology, ENT, um, even cardiology, you really need to be confident in order to jump on that bandwagon and mm. make that something, um, and you need to really invest your time into that. Whereas all GPs have sufficient amount of dermatology knowledge to see a, quite a chunk of Stuff mm. and manage them appropriately for the first contact. But yeah. again, yes, some of those things that we see aren't so hard and they're quite straightforward to manage uh, because by the time as it comes to you, uh, you know, time is a good diagnostic thing, isn't yeah. it? It's either resolved itself yeah. or it's fulminant so that you can easily tell what it is. Mm. But mm. there are there are those difficult cases there where you have to, you know, use a dermatoscope or get a good enough history that you can talk to the consultant about or someone else about to find out what it is or get a biopsy and things like that. So that's the next step onwards. Um, so I, I think, I don't know, I think I've answered that question. Is that right? I think yeah, that's I think, the reason. I, I think it's a good point that people almost feel they always have a solid base already because they're doing so much derm day to day in exactly. general practice yeah. and yeah. they've got enough derm in their day to realize I actually like this and maybe I want to take it a step further. Whereas some of the yeah. other specialties, maybe you don't get so much exposure and therefore confidence is not so high anyway. And yeah. therefore you wonder, can I actually get to that level of being a GP exactly. with a special interest? So, so yeah, yeah, it's a good point. And, and exposure plays a big part of it. Um, so say you hadn't got this fellowship. Say there's a GP trainee right now, GPSD one who thinks that, okay, I'll, I think about dermatology. It sounds like a good thing. What would you suggest someone does in GP training, or should they do anything in GP training to try and focus on dermatology, or should they wait till they come out the other end and then start? What would your advice be for that? I think that's a great question. I think that's the question most people struggle to answer. I think you need, there's two schools of thought. You, you either, the opportunity comes to you, or you explore, look for that opportunity, and you know, you, you're sorted, uh, you know, on a, you're on a training program and you go, or you ha you're forced into an area where you have to craft it yourself. And I think that's most people in the dermatology bandwagon because there's not a lot of uh, gypsy training school or gypsy fellowships that exist for any specialty in fact not just yeah. dermatology and I'm uh, a big fan of making your own way and make believe and I think the biggest thing that you have to look for is experience not academic qualifications they have their role in them and so as a GP trainee had this not come by what I would have done is um, when I got the salary job or even as a GP trainer, I would have said to the, the boss or whatever, it was like, you know what, can I, can we just, can I, would you mind if I see all the dermatology cases that come through the door and I will see them on one session, let's say Friday, Tuesday, whichever it is, that's not, you know, 
busy because obviously I, <laughs> you need to give them something to convince them, right? I'll see them all in one session because then I build my experience seeing that bulk of dermatology cases, yeah? And then I think I would add to that by doing the diploma, yeah? In, in the black country, we're funding diplomas for or any training that um, newly qualified first by GPs require. And all you have to do is convince your PCN director and your practice uh, partners and put in an application and we're funding it. So that funding is there. So it's nothing out of your pocket. You just have to build enough of case, which means that you have to convince yourself first, yourself first of all, and then write a little piece to say why it's worth it for the practice to invest in you and the PCN and the SDP. And then I think when you've convinced yourself and you've got a compelling story that you really, really want to do this, people believe you and people want to invest in you. And I think it's not as impossible as people think it is to do. So you've got to, yeah, you've got to basically build your case and sell your value and, and make it a no-brainer. Start small. Yeah, make it a no-brainer. Okay, so, so you mentioned a diploma there. What, what diploma was that? And, and is that something that people can do UK-wide? Um, you could, any GP or any qualified clinician can do uh, the uh, sort of um, additional knowledge uh, diplomas. It's just like going to uni and doing a master's. It just adds you that depth of knowledge in that specialty. For example, okay. I was on... Uh, a webinar today, lunchtime, uh, being taught by a dermatologist on skin cancers and what the surgical options for skin cancer man management are. Um, so you, it's mostly distant learning. Uh, I'm on the RILA course because it's more uh, exam-based and uh, webinar-based rather than coursework-based. But there's obviously the most popular one, which is Cardiff, which costs a fortune. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and, but, but that's more coursework orientated. So okay. again, you have a choice of what you think, what will fit you. I'm not a coursework kind of person. That's why I chose this one. Okay. Um, and it fits me well. And it gives you that extra depth and knowledge from a dermatology specialist point of view. And that's that experience that you need uh, okay. to make it happen. Because the, when the dermatologist is teaching you, it's an interactive session. You can ask them questions okay. about how you would apply to the general practice on a day-to-day -day basis. And then you can, again, build that experience. Because that's what I think differentiates uh, a good gypsy from someone who's just using theoretical yeah. knowledge. So just uh, a GP, it, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, and are these just, in essence, diplomas in dermatology? Are, is there a special name of the diploma that you really should be looking for? Or is it just you need a diploma in dermatology? Uh, I think, so there are certain ones. So the RCGP have recently introduced the GP with extended roles accreditation. Well, they accredited 100 people, and I think it's been put on hold because of COVID, so I'm yeah. sure it will come back around. So that yeah. accreditation necessitates for you to have a diploma be before you can be accredited as a JIPA. But, for example, a lot of the services have their internal mechanisms of making sure you're competent to deliver the service, and they don't strictly uh, require a, a certain diploma okay. per se. Okay. Any postgraduate diploma in dermatology that is credible from a UK institution Personally, I think will suffice. Of course, if you're applying for a job and they want a particular uh, diploma from a particular university, you have to yeah. accommodate that. Yeah. And if they're going to pay for it, then of course, uh, you might have to negotiate with them which one you do. Okay, okay. Um, and so there's lots of different ones and you can choose the one that kind of suits you best and the style that you learn best. And, and, and what about um, when you start it? So how long, did, how long would it take you to do an average diploma? Or does it differ hugely according from diploma to diploma. And could you do it in your GP training years? Is it, is it, is it you know, you know how busy GP training is, portfolios and, and exams, et cetera. Is it doable? Like, could you do it at the same time alongside? Uh, so it's usually about a year's distance learning. And uh, I know people who've done it through GP training. I know people who've okay. had funding to do it through GP training. Okay. So it's all possible. It just depends what else you've gone, got on, on your plate in your personal life and work life. Um, yeah. It is, it is just a couple of modules and a couple of exams. It's like sitting on e-learning and doing a couple of modules a day. Again, one of the reasons why I chose the Ryla one is that it's not so hands-on in terms yeah. of coursework. So it's, whereas my colleagues who are doing those ones are finding that they're really stretched for time because mm. they come home and they have to do their group work and the coursework and things like that. Whereas um, I prefer to learn from the experience. So I'm learning on a day-to-day -day basis from that hands-on experience where I'm seeing cases mm. and I'm just using the theoretical knowledge I'm getting from the e-learning and the exams to learn and help myself learn. So it's yeah. sort of um, self-directed uh, learning. It's okay. my preferred method. So okay. that's why I chose for this one. 
but again, you have that flexibility. And then, yeah, it's definitely doable during GP training. One of my mates, um, uh, Dem GP, she's on Instagram. She actually did it through uh, her GP training years while she was planning her wedding. So oh, wow. if she can do that, I think it's very doable. Wow. Well, I think I'll let her talk GP. about that one, but I wouldn't say. Um, but she, she's done it. So it's and, and funding. You mentioned funding. Like where, where, as a GP trainee, where are you going to go and get funding for these things? So, and, and, not, and not just GP training, even when you come out of GP training, so when you're a GP, where do you go and get funding for this stuff? So uh, I've heard of GP, uh, GP trainees uh, convince HVE to fund uh, medical education uh, diplomas during the okay, health education. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I don't see it being uh, a question that you can't ask. You can always ask the question and build a case. Again, if you are in a practice which you're going to end up staying in, you can... You can, you, it's all negotiation, isn't it? I mean, it's just like GP. You know, in GP land, any, every job, every job offer is different. You can negotiate what you want per job. Uh, likewise, I'm, I'm sure you, if you convince your partners that you're going to stay and you get a pre, pre-offer or something, and you yeah. can word it into that, they'll fund your um, uh, diploma in exchange for you to stay around and work for them for an extra two years. Um, uh, that's, uh, I think that's probably the most feasible way of doing, making it happen. Um, but the pots of funding that are there, for example, the Black Country STP have a pot of funding for portfolio careers, and that is open to all first five. And I'm sure uh, if you make a good enough case, they will consider you. Um, Sonia's uh, one was funded through the STP. Um, the condition is that she stays around in that area for two to three years working. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, interesting. So I could, I could see that So for some of the other gypsies where there's not that much there's not that many around that maybe you have to make your own way and build your own case. But I thought maybe for dermatology, because it's such a popular field for GPs to go down, there would have been something a little bit more formal. But as you said, it's more just go in and make your own road and, um, and push, your own, um, push your own way through, I suppose, uh, and negotiate. Interesting. So I, th- I think some people who are thinking about this will, will probably find that um, quite reassuring really that even if they haven't started a certain process they can still start now and push their own way interesting stuff uh, and i do think there are opportunities out there you just have to seek them out and you yeah. have to do your own digging um, as in yeah. modality in the midlands modality has got an extensive gypsy training program because of their community services from everything you can think of from pediatrics mm-hmm. to urology they have a training program so if you want to start something up you know you're more than welcome to join us any and if you want to ask more questions feel free to drop me a line at on my instagram uh apart from that you know you ha- you can chart your own way nothing is impossible okay uh, gp is so flexible you know there's costs that you just need to build a business case isn't it yeah and especially you, and especially now where everything is kind yeah. of been thrown, thrown up in the air and it's going to all start exactly. again in some certain ways okay that's really interesting so so if people are thinking about um being a gypsy and dermatology, that's a good start, whether you're a trainee or not. Let's talk a bit about aesthetics versus derm then, because a lot of GPs go down the aesthetics route, and a lot will go down the kind of mainstream dermatology gypsy route. And a lot, like yourself, I suppose, do a bit of both. So what are the main pros and cons of the aesthetics route versus the derm route and vice versa? Um, I think the main priority or the main difference, uh, sorry, is the, the aesthetics is wholly private. Um, dermatology is majority uh, NHS is a few uh, niche patients that you can build up onto a private practice with experience and over time. Uh, that's the whole difference, obviously. Uh, <clears throat> if you're NHS, you have to have an NHS patient base, whether you, that's within your practice that you convince your partners to give your session to do, or within another community service, like the modality, or there's loads of private tenders out there that uh, companies which um, hire gypsies to do private dermatology clinics like Circle in Wolverhampton, I think they, they just run through them. Um, and of course, whereas uh, in aesthetics, it's wholly yourself. You are everything for that business, from the marketer to the clinical governance person to setting up the, your clinical management portal to your patient records to selling, that, selling to the patients on the thing. Um, and I think the biggest difference that people notice when they make this jump is the fact that in aesthetics, you can say no don't have to treat every patient Mm. you know you have to set some boundaries and I think this is where uh, business acumen comes into play it is purely business 99% of doing aesthetics is your ability to sell and run a business 1% 
is your uh, ability as an injector. Maybe not 1%, but maybe, you know, yeah, 10 some, to 20%. Some, some people might your argue ability that a little bit. as an injector. Yeah. yeah because yeah. if you can't get that patient through the door, you're not injecting. Yeah. If you're not yeah. injecting, you're not getting experience. If you're not yeah. getting experience, you're not active on Instagram or social media, and people can't see what you're doing. Mm. So there's no more, so it's a vicious cycle, so you, but it, it's a slow cycle to build up. Of. Now, I've been doing it for three years now, you know, and it, I think that some of the, so the statistic is about 75% of all people who train or come, come to training courses don't pursue a career. Mm. They do the course uh, and within a month or two, this is a statistic. They pack up and go, because they this don't, I think, yeah, I think there's a false um, ideology in that it's going to pick up overnight, it's going to happen. Yeah. No business is like that. You have to taper. You have to set yourself goals. You have to say it's going to, it will pick up, but it will take time. And you have to put your effort and investment into it. The compounding effect, isn't it? Over time, it will compound yeah, of course, yeah. to where you become a, uh, it becomes a viable additional source of income or additional yeah. um, passion of yours. Whereas it's not going to happen in the first year. Not, you should expect nothing in your first year. Well, I mean, yeah, this, this mirrors the med ed world. Like, you know, we see a lot of people set up educational courses and then within a few months they realize actually this is this is tough you know exactly. people aren't going to come in yeah. and, and, and book on your <laughs> stuff without any background work so yeah exactly, exactly yeah. the same thing i suppose so so which one do you enjoy most like hand on heart do you enjoy the aesthetic side of it most or do you enjoy the derm side of it most like what if you had to choose one right now like your career is going to go one way only which one are you going to pick <clears throat> i think um what do i enjoy the most Definitely aesthetics, because, you know, when I inject fillers, I see the effect straight in from my eyes. And there is no restriction as to what treatment I use, I can use uh, on a patient. There is no, you know, it's not funded in the NHS, sorry. If the patient is willing to pay for it, I can do it. And yeah. that's anything, and I can get them the results that they want. Um, so that's good. And then most of the stuff I do, it's hands-on, whether mm. it's hair loss PRP or Botox fillers, uh, minor surgery, majority of it's hands-on. So it's exciting and it's just fun um, because I like that hands-on experience. Yeah, yeah. Um, the caveat to that is, um, is what's going to be a sustainable thing is the other caveat to that in that you have to understand that you know, it's an exploding industry. However, there is a lot of undercutting with a lot of other people trying to get into the market in terms of beauticians and things. And uh, you know, the, some of us will, you know, value the exp experience and expertise because you know these are dangerous. These are drugs at the end of the day, and they have lots of you know risks and complications to these procedures. But um, sometimes people people go for the cheaper option, and that doesn't always end well. Um, but uh, there is an influx of that and the prices, the margins are being driven down. So mm. um, long term, is it a viable option? Potentially, if you're going to go full term and all out, I think it's probably possibly a viable option. Yeah, yeah. But again, you have to balance that out and think what's going to work for you. For me, it works for me because I train. That brings me additional income. Mm. And I do the modality private clinic and I do my own stuff. So yeah. all together, they balance out, the books balance out. Yeah. And uh, it's a sustainable thing long term. So you have to think about that and plan for the future. Yeah. So I guess I, I, your decision, I guess, makes sense because the original reason that you, you, you wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon, right? So you wanted to be all the hands-on stuff. So it kind of makes sense. But the dermatology side of it, I guess, is only going to help that. I suppose each is only going to help each other, right? The derm stuff that you do and the aesthetic side, it's gonna, they're going to complement each other, as does general practice and dermatology. So the, the, the kind of three things that you're doing um, all kind of work, I think. And, and you mentioned one important thing, there, that, that someone almost has to go full time for, to make it work. So let's talk about GPs who start off doing a little bit of dermatology on the side or aesthetics or whatever it might be. And then they decide to go full into the dermatology world. Like how common is it for A, do people go to go fully into actual dermatology, NHS dermatology as a gypsy? And then B, how common is it for people to turn full-time into the aesthetics world? Or do you mostly get like what you do, which is, which is a bit of both? I think, you know, it's normal distribution, isn't it, if you think about it. There, 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 I know plenty of aestheticians who've not even done GP training and gone straight in after F1, F2, straight into aesthetics full on, and they're doing really well on Harley Street, um, etc. I know plenty of uh, Harley Street gypsies who are purely doing aesthetics and their dermatology, cosmetic dermatology on Harley Street, and they're very successful. Um, again, there are... 
plenty of gypsies in dermatology within our modality service that a majority of their week is spent on gypsy service. They do do the one or you know, two sessions of GP a day to maintain that competency. Um, so there is a breadth of, I think the spectrum is there. I think it's personal choice and uh, sort of what's available to you as an opportunity. Um, uh, I think that determines which path everyone takes and how brave brave and bold you are i guess as well yeah 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 and 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 i guess it comes down to why people went to general practice in the first place if you're really passionate about general practice you, you will keep doing that for you know whatever else comes up um, whereas if you went in for, for other reasons and maybe it'd be easier to, to to walk away and go fully into derm i guess so as you say there's a big range of of experiences and you see both don't you You see people balancing it really well and you see people who are who have gone purely into into the derm side so if you have someone right now in GP training or even pre-GP training who thinks that they might be interested in, in, in this side, in either one or the other, dermatology, aesthetic, combination of both, what, where can they, they, they get more information? You know, what kind of sites can they look at? Where can they find out more about this world, this ever-changing world, I suppose? Uh, feel free to drop me a message because I can look you up, link, look, link you into the modality uh, uh, gypsy training program and we can have a conversation as to whether you know uh, it'll work for you and um, that's one source and of course the other source is the BAD and the RCGP have a list of diplomas that are uh, sort of recognized that you can look at in terms of following that route um, and I guess the aesthetic route Derma Medical if you, if you go on the website if you google Derma Medical it'll come up with all of our courses feel free to book onto one of our courses and come for the foundation day um, and Sometimes we do webinars where we explore, you know, career in um, aesthetics. And there are lots of blog articles on the website as well as to pointing towards what a career might be and what kind of skills you need to build a, uh, a career in aesthetics. So those great. are really uh, directions um, as to how to proceed. Okay, great. So. And, and where are you going to be in five, to in five years? You've, been, you've just started, you're <laughs> 35 months into being a GP, but let's think five years down the line, what's your, what's your week going to like? How's it going to be different from now? <laughs> That's an interesting question. I'd like to know, but I, I, could, I don't quite know. Um, I, I'm, I think, as most people do and should do, I, I'm trying things out to see what I like, what works for me, and what uh, I will, you know, I have passion for that can sustain for that longer time. So I think time will tell in terms of uh, uh, what I do. Uh, but I think dermatology and aesthetics is definitely something I'll carry on doing. It's a very diplomatic answer. <laughs> you've been to a lot of meetings too, but you can tell <laughs> no brilliant thank you and, 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 and you know hopefully it's opened people's eyes to, to a little bit about what, what the world of derm is what the world of aesthetics is um, currently because like I said it's an ever changing world and, and, and demands are only going to go um, higher and higher I suppose for this um, area yeah. and specialty and subspecialty and all that kind of stuff um, but thank you I think it's been really really helpful uh, for people hopefully sure. if they have any questions they can contact you what are your handles to, uh, on, on various social media streams so it's at Dr. Amuthan or at, at Dr. Amuthan on Instagram. Um, equally on same on uh, LinkedIn. You can find me on LinkedIn as well and Facebook as well. Um, so it's Dr. Amuthan on all of them on Twitter as well, Dr. Amuthan. Stephen, I've got to ask you, and you use a lot of our resources and courses. What, how do you think about our stuff? And it seems like a long time ago now. <laughs> We use I know, AKT, I, know. I think. It's mainly AKT. But definitely. I think. It's the most, I think the most, the thing I used the most was your audiobook. I'm dyslexic. I hate reading. Um, so your audiobooks and your webinars is probably what helped me with the AKT. Brilliant. Um, that's what got me through the AKT, I think. Brilliant. And, and if you guys are new, I definitely recommend those. Uh, Thank you, I think man. I have. I, I think everyone asks me about AKT knows what to get from you. I'm sure people have come to us and I said, how do you find us? Oh, Tuba mentioned. So, so you're certainly helping us. <laughs> really, video, that's which is, great. Which is great. But for those of you guys who don't know, if you're just joining us for the first time, we run or well, are in Aurora Medical Education and we train uh, GPs, not just GPs to be, but right through from PLAB and medical school through to MSRA, through to GP training, uh, which is where I met Tuba. Um, so if you guys need any help with that, please go to the website, auroramedicaleducation.co.uk. And just for watching this Insta video, there's a 10% discount off anything on the website. The code is AuroraInsta10, A-R-O-R-A-I-N-S-T-A-1-0. And hopefully you can get some value using that discount. But thank you so much, buddy. Hopefully we'll get to catch up with you once all this ends up um, settling yeah, down. And hopefully we'll get you on another Insta in the future to see an update. Fantastic. Cool. Look forward to it. Cheers. Cheers. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you.